All right. So, um, for those of you who don't know, obviously we, we mentioned the announcements. Easter is next week. The uh, Sunday prior to Easter, which is today, is typically recognized as Palm Sunday. And um, we read the story here in John chapter 12. Of course, the other Gospels give accounts as well that um, Palm Sunday is the day. If you look at verse number 12 of John 12, where we started reading, the Bible says, On the next day, much people that were come to the feast when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. And Jesus, when he had found a young ass, sat thereon, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, thy king cometh, sitting on an ass's colt. So Jesus is fulfilling prophecy. He's entering into Jerusalem as the king, the people, by and large, you know, there's a lot of people that, that have accepted him and they're shouting and saying, Hosanna, you know, um, uh, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. And, and a lot of people are recognizing him as the king. And we also have to remember, too, in, uh, in we saw this throughout the whole Bible study of the book of Acts and in the book of John as well, that a lot of people confused because you remember we, we have the benefit of, of having the New Testament along with the Old Testament. They didn't have as much clarity, as much clarification on the Old Testament scriptures. Now, they understood a lot. They had a lot there. But obviously, the more that's revealed, the, the more information you have, the more understanding you get. And um, after Christ came, Christ revealed a lot more. The Apostle Paul, you know, all the, the, the books of the New Testament helped to understand a lot more. But what they thought... What seems to be pretty evident from Scripture is that the people thought that when Jesus was coming, that he was going to literally set up his kingdom on earth then, at his first coming. We know, obviously now, that he's not doing that until his second coming, when he's going to establish the kingdom and he's going to rule and reign and there's going to be peace and everything else, you know, everything else that's coming is going to come at Jesus Christ's second coming. It's not with his first coming. But um, that's actually one of the reasons why a lot of the Jews rejected Jesus was because of their understanding of Scripture. They didn't understand it. And, I mean, for the most part, it's because they weren't saved, but they didn't understand the Scripture. They thought he was coming. And um, we saw in, in Marching to Zion yesterday the point that was made. Um, one of the rabbis that, that was interviewed said that, well, you know, none of, the, none of the scholars, none of the rabbis at the time accepted him. They were well studied. They knew the Bible, you know, and, and they didn't accept him as the Messiah. And they were saying, and they described the Messiah as being someone that's going to come. He's going to be a good ruler. He's going to fight the battles for Israel. He's going to bring world peace. He's going to do all this stuff. And, and when we look at Scripture, so Scripture, it's describing the Antichrist perfectly. That's who they're expecting to come. They're going to think, they're going to receive the Antichrist with open arms because they're going to think it is the Messiah. They're deceived already. They have this vision of who the Messiah is, which is why they rejected Christ, because he didn't fit their, their vision of what the Messiah is and what he's going to do. And um, when the Antichrist comes, they're going to completely fall for that because when the Antichrist comes, he will end up bringing world peace. And... Um, So anyways, I don't want to get too far off on that subject. I just wanted to point that out. But we see here, you know, today's Palm Tour, we're, we're, giving, we're giving recognition to this event that happened. It's Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And he's sitting on that ass, on that ass's colt, and um, fulfilling prophecy from Zechariah 9. And um, there's so many things that Jesus did that just fulfilled all of these different prophecies throughout the Old Testament, which is why it's, it's silly for anyone to reject Jesus in light, especially at that time, I mean, in light of all these prophecies. But, um, you know, we're blessed to have the New Testament. A lot of this stuff is spelled out and, and the connections are already made for us. Um, even in John chapter 12, as early as John 12, they realized this. I mean, these, the disciples didn't realize it at the moment. When they were in the moment, Jesus Christ was on the ass and they're coming in and these people are saying, Hosanna and everything else is going on. They didn't make the connection of the fulfillment of prophecy right then. But after the resurrection of Christ, a lot of these things were opened up to them. And then they're like, oh yeah, remember this? Oh yeah, remember, you know, when it's, the fullness of, of Jesus Christ's mission and his death and his burial and his resurrection took place, 
their, their eyes were opened up to a lot more scripture. So even when, when the Apostle John is writing down this, this, this book of John, he says um, in verse 16, These things understood not his disciples at the first, but when Jesus was glorified, then remembered they that these things were written of him and that they had done these things on them. So they're like, oh yeah, after, after he was glorified, then they remembered, oh yeah, all this happened. And it lines up and he fulfilled that scripture as well. And it's a pretty amazing thing. And anytime you really consider and look at the, the prophecies that Jesus Christ fulfilled, it is an amazing thing. I mean, this specific one was from the book of Zechariah. You look at the book of Psalms. You look in the books of Moses. You look in all of the different books of the prophets. I mean, there are, there are prophecies in all of them. And Jesus fulfilled you know, everything pertaining to his first coming. And to be able to fulfill those prophecies by, written by different men, different periods of time, is just incredible. And, and that in itself is a, is a testimony and a proof that Jesus was the Christ. Because, and, and it proves that this is the word of God, not the word of man. You cannot have the perfection of the fulfillment of these prophecies. Now, and when you look at these too, this isn't some Nostradamus stuff, right? You read the Nostradamus predictions and it's just like real generic and then eventually something will happen in, in, in the future over, over all these years where, oh, in this part of the world, this thing happened. And you look at his cryptic language and you can make some kind of parallel and say, oh, yeah, see, you know, he prophesied that. Jesus Christ, I mean, all of these prophecies came to pass in a very, very short time within just a few years. Millennia of, of, of predictions and prophecies came to pass by, from different authors all in that short period of time. So don't, you know, don't get too caught up with these other false prophets like the Nostradamuses and stuff. Say, oh, wow, you know, he was a prophet. He, you know, he knew this stuff. His, I've read some of his, his prophecies and they're garbage. They're, they're, it's like the, it's like the, um, the psych, they're all, yeah, they're all hit and miss. I mean, there's, there's some stuff he says, and so, you know, where you can say, oh, yeah, this, this lines up. But um, again, it's, it's, you have to read into it and then be able to apply it to something. I mean, y you look at something long enough and, y and you take someone's words, you could, you could ultimately make it apply to all kinds of different things. People do the same thing with the Bible. I mean, they'll apply Scripture to all kinds of different things that are going on. It doesn't mean that that's what it's talking about. But Jesus Christ specifically fulfilled these um, these prophecies. Now turn, if you would, to Matthew 21. We'll see this a, a, a few more details in Matthew 21 of his entry into Jerusalem. Now, where we just read in John 12, it said, then Jesus, six days before the Passover, I forgot to point this out a little bit. Um, this is an important point, but you don't have to, you just keep going to Matthew, to Matthew 21. John 12, one of the reasons why I started there is because it gives us, it helps to, to give the timeline of when these events happened. So um, it says six days before the Passover, that's when he has his feast with Lazarus. That's when he's, he's, he's visiting and they're, and they're, and they're having that, that feast together. And then it says on the next day in verse 12, much people that were come to the feast when they heard that Jesus was coming, those are the people that took the palm trees the palm branches, and, and were saying all these things as he entered into Jerusalem. Because in, on the six days before the Passover, he was in Bethany, and then five days before the Passover, he was making his entry into Jerusalem. And this lines up perfectly with Scripture of the Passover lamb. Now, in the Old Testament, we're not going to go to the Old Testament and point this out, but I just want to, for those of you who aren't familiar, um, the Passover always took place on the 14th day of the month, right? And the 14th day of the month, Abib. And then on the 10th day is when they were supposed to like choose the lamb that they were going to offer. Now, the lamb, of course, had to be without spot, without blemish, of, you know, uh, basically one of the best of the flock. Like you could, you could have no, um, no problems with it, no broken bones, nothing like that. The, the lamb had to be a, a, a choice lamb. There was always requirements that they put on it. So they, they were supposed to separate that and choose that lamb 
on the 10th day. So then they had like a few days up until the 14th day to just make sure that that lamb was good. On the 14th day then is when they would sacrifice and kill that lamb. And then the 15th day started the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And um, like, talk about fulfillment of prophecy and fulfillment of Scripture. Five days, it says it was basically five days before the Passover, but if you think of the 10th, the 11th, 12th, 13th, and 14th as five days, it lines up with the choosing out of the Lamb with Jesus Christ's entry into the, into the city and them saying, Hosanna, and you know he's the king coming in. They've chosen the Lamb. He is, and, and of course, Jesus Christ was the Lamb without spot. He was a Lamb without blemish. He was without sin. He was perfect in every single way. And he was, you know, chosen out on this day just a few days prior to his death. You know, just, um, and his sacrifice, his sacrificial offering of himself as that Passover lamb for us. But you're in Matthew 21. We'll see a few more details about his entering into the city. Look at verse number 7. The Bible reads, uh, And brought the ass and the colt and put on them their clothes, and they set him thereon. And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees and strawed them in the way. And the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he was coming in Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. So we see here, you know, they're, they're really um, giving him this kingly entrance. They put their clothing um, on top of the, uh, of the colt that he was sitting on. They, they, you know, they, they make it nice for him and then put him there on. And he's sitting on that. And then even just, just in the way as he's going, people are laying down their garments. They're laying down these branches and everything, just paving the, the way for him. And you know, rolling out the red carpet, so to speak, is what we would, we would think about today. They're, they're really giving him this fancy entrance, this great entrance, and recognizing him as the king. And um, this is like the high point in Jesus' ministry, right? I mean, he's been, he's been doing all his work for three and a half years, and um, he hits this point, and then it's all downhill from there because we see he has the, um, we're going to see the Last Supper that he has with his disciples, and then he's betrayed, of course, and arrested, and, and, and all the horrible things that happened to him. He's crucified before his, um, his resurrection, which I guess is the ultimate pinnacle of, of ev all of his work that he did, is his resurrection. Um, you, can't, you can't trump that. That was the highlight, and that's what our salvation is all about, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, um, his, his triumph over death. But let's go ahead and turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 22, because what, what I want to talk about, that was just to give you, you know, a little bit of a... A little bit of understanding about the holidays and, and why today is called Palm Sunday. You know, a lot of times we have a tendency in Christian churches just to, to follow certain traditions without understanding why or what they're all about. Um, and what we're going to be doing today, we're going to be actually taking communion at the end of the service, at the end of the sermon. And um, we're going to, I want to help explain why we do that. You know, as, as a child, I would go and you hear different things and you could hear a little bit about it, but like, I want to make sure we fully understand why we do this and what we're doing because it's tied in completely with the Passover. This is essentially the, 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 the taking of the, the, the bread and the wine is a replacement of the celebration of Passover because Jesus Christ fulfilled the Passover. Obviously, we're not, you know, as Christians, sacrificing lambs every year for, to celebrate Passover. That's done. Jesus Christ, when Jesus Christ offered up himself, he was that sacrificial lamb. He fulfilled that portion of scripture. That's done. He fulfilled that. But he also left us with a different memorial, a different remembrance. And yes, the, the Passover lamb was a commandment. It was something that they were commanded to, to do and to follow. But the purpose of it really was symbolic and it was for a memorial. It was for something that can be done over and over, year after year after year to keep all this prophecy, all this truth fresh in people's minds. You know, when you, when you do these types of traditions and ceremonies, 
it's um, it sticks with people a lot longer and, and um, you know even when it gets to the point to where the the education stops and, and, and the, the um, explanation of the symbolism stops you, the usually those traditions will continue to happen and then later on people will be like well wait why are we doing all this and then and then get back to the to the real purpose of it but look at Luke 22 verse number 7 Luke 22 verse 7 we're gonna see um, Jesus Christ at his, at his last supper here with his disciples verse 7 reads then came the day of unleavened bread when the Passover must be killed and he sent Peter and John saying go and prepare us the Passover that we may eat and they said unto him, Where wilt thou that we prepare? And he said unto them, Behold, when ye are entered into the city, there shall a man meet you, bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house where he entereth in. And ye shall say unto the goodman of the house, The master saith unto thee, Where is the guest chamber where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples? And he shall show you a large upper room furnished. There make ready. And they went and found as he had said unto them, and they made ready the Passover, and when the hour was come, he sat down, and the twelve apostles with him, and he said unto them, With desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this. And divide it among yourselves, for I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took bread and gave thanks and brake it and gave unto them, saying, This is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. Likewise also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood which is shed for you. Jesus Christ is... is bringing in the New Testament and spelling it out for the disciples at this moment in this Last Supper. I mean, he is, he is giving them this full explanation saying, look, this is my, he said, see this bread? And, he, and he's breaking it. He says, this is my body. And then, so now he's explaining the symbolic references of why we will partake in this supper. It's, it's, it's to do in remembrance. So he said, this do in remembrance of me. He says, this is something I want you to continue doing. I want you to, to carry on this tradition and do this in remembrance of me. This is, this is what I want you to do because he's fulfilling the Passover. So he doesn't want them to continue offering up a, a, a lamb as a sacrifice anymore. He is that sacrifice. But instead, we're going to honor Jesus Christ. We're going to remember what he did when we break the bread and eat that and remember Jesus Christ said I am the bread of life and he's talking about you know you must eat the bread you have to eat me in order to have eternal life and the people a lot of people didn't understand that they're like what are you talking about and he says that my body is meat indeed and my blood is drink indeed and of course he's, he's speaking symbolically of, of his death of his breaking of his body and shedding of his blood for the remission of our sins but um, this, is, this is what he established as the New Testament following, as a, one of the New Testament ordinances that we are supposed to follow even to this day. Um, <clears throat> turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians 11. That'll be the last place we turn. 1 Corinthians chapter number 11. See, in Luke, that's obviously Jesus Christ establishing this. We see the words of Jesus Christ. He's speaking to his disciples. He's setting this up. He's establishing it. And then in 1 Corinthians 11, we see a little bit more information from the Apostle Paul. Um, the, the epistles of Paul, we see a lot more um, information on how the church is to be run, how these things are, are to be put in order and set in order within the church. Paul gives a lot of, a lot of information and details about how we ought to be running a New Testament church. So we're going to see in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 um, so a little bit, just a little bit more details, a little bit more information on how we carry these things out. So look at verse number 18. 
of 1 Corinthians chapter number 11. The Bible reads, For first of all, when ye come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. For there must be also heresies among you, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. When ye come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, every one taketh before other his own supper, and one is hungry, and another is drunken. What? Have ye not houses to eat and to drink in, or despise ye the church of God, and shame them that have not? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup, when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. So obviously we see here, this is established until he comes again. He's saying you're showing the Lord's death until he come. And he says in verse 23, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you. Paul's teaching these people, this is what you need to do. This is how we, you know, Jesus Christ said this when he had given thanks for the food that they had, when he had given thanks for the bread, he break it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. And then the same thing with the, um, with the cup of the New Testament of his blood. He says, Every, you know, as often as you do this. Now, I don't believe that there is a um, scriptural requirement on how often you need to participate in it. Some people think you do it every Sunday. Some people think you do it once a year, like at this time of year, what we're doing right now. I don't, I don't think either of those things. I think it's just as often as you do it, which is kind of open to... to and you know, just to be able to, okay, we're going to do it. We're going to recognize Jesus now. We're going to, oh, hey, let, let's recognize what Jesus did for us. You know, as, as often as you do it, we do it in remembrance of Christ. So, because he didn't lay out and say, you must do this, you know, every year. Now, as a church, we will be making sure that we do this at least once a year, at least at this time of year, because it coincides perfectly with when the disciples did it, with when they had their last supper and everything else. And it's so symbolic of what Jesus did for us as the Passover lamb. So the week before Easter, we were going to be um, recognizing and following this. But it doesn't mean that we won't also, you know, um, perform the same ordinance again just in the future at, at another time. But we will always be observing this at least on on this day every year because of, the, because of all the references and just, just putting Jesus in remembrance of us. So he says um, in verse 27, we get a few more details about this as well. Um, Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. So is this some flippant thing that we do? Or does it look like it's pretty serious? I mean, he's saying you eat and drink damnation to yourself if you're drinking unworthily. This is something that's not just tossed aside. This isn't something, oh yeah, you know, we do that, well... And it's not a big deal. This is a very big deal. First of all, it's, it's, it's done solemnly and, and in respect and reverence to what Jesus Christ did for us. And we are honoring and, and giving respect unto what he did. And, and we're showing that his, I mean, his death is a serious thing. Him breaking his body 
and shedding his blood. You know, these are terms that you hear over and over again, and we can have a tendency to get desensitized to it, just thinking, oh yeah, Jesus broke his body and shed his blood for us. Because, of course he did, because we've learned that and heard that over and over again. But think about what that means. I mean, his body literally was broken. There's a lot of pain associated with what he went through. His shedding of blood. I mean, when you get hurt, when you get injured, and you start bleeding, you know, Jesus Christ bled a lot. When he had that crown of thorns on his head, they beat him. They whipped him. The Bible talks about him being able to see his bones. He says, I, I could tell my bones, which means he was able to count them because they whipped him and, and, the, and the, the whip just, just made such a big gash through his skin, through his body. I, I know, I mean, it sounds gory, but, and, and it is. But we have to recognize and remember, this is what he went for for you. Because of his love for you, he went through that and he suffered that. And we are recognizing, putting this in remembrance, and hopefully humbling ourselves and getting over ourselves and whatever problems we might have in this life when we recognize what Jesus Christ did for us and did for everybody. So that we can exalt Him and, and get ourselves right and, and, and stop worrying about the, the other little things that don't matter and the distractions in our life and maybe reset our lives and get more focused on serving Him because of what He did for us. Because He went through the pain. He shed His blood. He did these things. We ought to serve Him. We ought to do what's right and not, and not just take for granted everything that He did for us. Let's keep reading because he says here, I'm going to, we'll reread verse 29. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you and many sleep. Let's not look over that verse. For this very cause, for what cause? For the cause that people are eating and drinking unworthily. For that cause, because people are actually doing that in the church at Corinth, he says, because of that, many people are weak and sickly and many sleep. See, some people even die because they're drinking unworthily of that cup. And, and they're, you know, they're, they're not right with God when they partake in this, in this sacrament. Verse number 31, For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Wherefore, my brethren, when ye come together to eat, tarry one for another. And if any man hunger, let him eat at home, that ye come not together into condemnation. And the rest will I set in order when I come. So, one of the things we get from this, when, you know, a little bit earlier we, we read that um, he's saying, look, don't you have houses to eat and drink? And you're like, one guy comes in, he's, he's real hungry. Another one is drunken. And he's like, look, you have houses to eat and drink. And when we partake of the Lord's Supper, this isn't like your meal. This isn't, you're not coming here like super hungry and just, oh man, I can't wait to eat that bread and drink that juice. That's not what we're, that's not what it's all about. You know, you have homes, eat and drink and, you know, do that there. When you come here to partake in the Lord's, in the Lord's Supper, it's in remembrance of him. This is why we're doing this. Now, uh, as far as the unworthily part, you know, a lot of different churches have different rules about the way that they administer the Lord's Supper. Some churches say, no, you have to be a member of our church or else you cannot partake in this. I don't believe in that. That's not the way we do things here. Unworthily, I think, is twofold. And I think we need to, to and, and again, everyone needs to examine themselves today judge within yourselves one definitely unworthy if you're not saved if your faith isn't in the lord jesus christ for your salvation you should not be partaking in this and this actually has a scriptural reference back in exodus 12 when it talks about the passover you don't have to turn there i'll just read it for you there's a few verses in Exodus chapter 12, the Bible reads, And the Lord said unto Moses and Aaron, This is the ordinance of the Passover. There shall no stranger eat thereof. A stranger is just a foreigner. Someone who's not of Israel. It says, No stranger shall eat thereof. But every man's servant that is bought for money, 
when thou hast circumcised him, then shall he eat thereof. A foreigner and an hired servant shall not eat thereof. He's saying, now, don't forget this too though. Israel also accepted people that converted to, to worship the Lord from all nations. So it's not that any foreigner can't partake in this, but they had to be circumcised because circumcision was part of the, obeying the law. So when you converted to, to put your faith in the Lord from another nation or whatever, they would get circumcised. And then, yeah, he says there's one law for the foreigner as well as, as for those that are uh, of Israel. But um, that was one of the laws that he had. He says, look, a foreigner, like an uncircumcised or some hired servant, some, some worker, someone here that's just making money or um, just someone who's, who's sojourning in the land, someone who's staying in the land, but they're a foreigner, they can't partake in the Passover. The same way that people who aren't saved shouldn't be taking part in the Lord's Supper in the, bo in the, in the body and blood of Jesus Christ. So um, that's one thing. But also I believe that just being, drinking unworthily, meaning you're not right with God for some reason. You have some major sin in your life. If you've got something and you're, and you're just completely out of fellowship with the Lord, I think we need to examine ourselves. And if you feel like like, you know something for yourself. And look, don't use this time to be looking around and being like, who's not taking? You know, people all have their own reasons. And, and um, that's why we just judge within ourselves. Whether or not, because, it's, because it is a serious matter. Because he's saying, look, for this cause, when you eat and drink unworthily, you're eating and drinking damnation to yourself. And many people are weak and sickly. And you're going to, you know, God's not going to bless you when you're, when you're partaking of this stuff. And you're not um, recognizing it appropriately and giving it the proper respect and attention that it deserves, and and you know eating and drinking worthily. So this is the way that we that we do it here: is that if you're saved, you are welcome to partake in the the body and blood of Christ. So symbolically, and one other point, you know, the Catholics believe in transubstantiation. They believe that. The wafer that they eat literally becomes the flesh of Jesus Christ and the wine that they drink literally becomes his blood as they drink it. That is a bizarre twist of doctrine. We don't believe that. Okay, This is symbolic of Jesus Christ breaking his, his, his flesh. We're not literally eating the flesh of Jesus Christ. Even when he said that, I mean, it's an allegory. He's, he's, he's giving the, the reference, okay, this is my body. It's the bread. You know, I'm the bread of life. But um, it's not, he's not literally talking about cannibalism. But what we do here, when we take the bread, the, it's, it's unleavened. And unleavened for a reason. The same way that the, the, the wine that we drink, and this is another sermon, the wine that we drink is unfermented. Okay, leaven is to bread as the fermentation is to wine. They are both symbolic of sin in the Bible. Leaven all throughout the Bible, it, 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 you know, um, Jesus Christ said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. When you put leaven in the bread, you only need a small amount and it spreads and infects the whole thing. It's always referring to sin. When we're taking bread as the body of Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ was without sin. So if we were to eat leavened bread as, as part of our observance of the Lord's Supper, we would be blasphemous, bla blasphemously equating uh, leavened bread to the body of Jesus because Jesus had no sin so it should, the bread should have no leaven. When leaven is, is used throughout the whole Bible as, as referring to sin, it's the same way with the wine. Now, when the Bible talks about wine, this is an entire sermon of itself, but um, when the Bible refers to wine, there's only one place in the Bible the Bible uses the word juice and it uses the word juice because wine is already used in the same verse. Wine has multiple meanings. The word wine is used interchangeably, whether it be for um, an alcoholic beverage or a non-alcoholic beverage. And the way that you can tell the difference is by the context. You have to see, you know, I mean, it goes from the extreme of talking about this is the poison of asps 
and Proverbs talking about wine, I mean, that is an extreme negative saying, whoa, he's saying like, don't look on the wine when it is red, when it giveth its color in a cup, when it moveth itself aright. He said, don't even look at it. There's a certain wine that's the wine of Sodom, the Bible refers to. But then there's another wine, like Jesus turned water into wine at the wedding feast, right? So how do you go from Jesus creating this wine, but then there's another wine that's, that's called the, the, you know, the wine of Sodom? Because wine is simply referring to the, the, the juice that comes from the fruit, right? You could have multiple types of wine. You squeeze an apple, you get apple juice. You know, that's a type of wine in, in, in one sense of the word. Same thing with the grapes. I mean, you squeeze the grapes, you get grape juice. It's wine um, the way that the Bible is using the word wine. And then, of course, alcoholic wine, it comes from the same thing. It has just gone through the process of fermentation and the, you know, the sugar is getting up and then alcohol is produced and then you have this, this alcohol. And I'm not, I don't know, I'm not an expert on, on all the fermentation process, so, um, but I do know enough to, to know that the, sh the, the sugars get, get you know, eaten up by, you know, in, the, in the, the, the chemical process that happens, the alcohol is produced and then all of a sudden you have an alcoholic beverage. So, but that process of fer fermentation is, is essentially, it's the, like the bacteria that's just like the, um, the leaven in the bread. And if the leaven is symbolic of sin, I believe also that the fermentation is also symbolic of sin, which is why we don't drink alcoholic wine when we partake, because that would be like, again, inserting sin into Jesus. Jesus was perfect. His blood was pure. So we drink the pure blood of the grape. As, which is another biblical reference. And again, all of that, I, I have an entire sermon where I preach specifically on the, on the topic of alcohol, if you're interested in learning more about that, where I go through, because I'm kind of just quoting a lot of these different references and not even giving you what the references are because I don't have them memorized. But um, this is the reasoning behind why we do what we do. And the last thing is like we don't have pre-made wafers that's, that's already form-fitted and stuff. Because Jesus Christ, when he took the bread, he broke it. And, and we don't want to lose that symbolism of him breaking his body with a pre-formed thing, like a little oyster cracker or something. You know, it's broken. All of these pieces are broken. And just to remember that he broke his body for us and he shed his blood for us. So... Um, We're going to close in a word of prayer. We're going to give thanks for what Jesus Christ did as he did when he was with his disciples. He broke the bread. He gave thanks unto God. And then they partook of that bread and that wine. So let's, let's pray right now to God. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the wonderful gift that you've given to us. Um, of salvation and for Jesus Christ breaking his body and shedding his blood to save us from our sins dear Lord and to cleanse us I pray that you would please just um, recognize this the the Lord's Supper um, that we're going to be partaking in this morning and um, Lord help us all to examine our own hearts and examine our own lives dear Lord that we wouldn't eat and drink damnation to ourselves but um we, we are fully giving you the reverence that you deserve in this, um, this symbolic re remembrance of what you did for us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.